This is Whitney, and you're listening to the Jcast on Jabberlog. Welcome to Within the Trenches, true stories from the 911 dispatchers who live them. Hey, what's going on? This is Ricardo with Jabberlog on the Jcast. I'm sitting here with my co-host, Whitney, and this is episode number seven of Within the Trenches. What's going on, Whit? Hey, thanks for having me here again today, Ricardo. Hey, everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you were... Whitney was just saying that we've been working all weekend, and we we really haven't. We had to do a retake because I, again, opened up this episode with another lie, stating, yeah, we've been so busy. We worked all weekend. It feels like the days are going together. And I put my hand over the microphone, and I looked at Ricardo and shook my head and said... We didn't work all weekend. This is our exactly. weekend that we go into work. We had the weekend <laughs> off, but either way, it's been rather busy for us, actually. So that's probably why you know, everything's meshing together and stuff. Right. And our shift last night was interesting. I mean, there wasn't a lot going on, uh, but anybody who works on dispatch, even though there's not a lot going on, um, there are those few calls that kind of can be draining. So that's that's kind of how uh, it was going last night. But, you know, we've got a lot of requests for the show, and we're filling up our schedule. So everything is going great for Within the Trenches. Um, last week, we had uh, two of Ottawa's finest. We had Crystal and Jen. Uh, Ottawa for episode, and Ottawa. Yeah, Ottawa and Ottawa for episode six, which was a good time. But this week, we have Joshua with West Bloomfield PD. What's going on, man? Hey, Josh. Hey, guys. How are you doing? We are awesome. doing great. Thanks for being good. here with us today. I appreciate it. Hey, no problem. So uh, this episode, uh, it's it's all about you, man. Um how exactly, you know, what what drove you to uh, to dispatching? You know, everybody's got a story, and that's that's what we want to do. We want to tell everyone's story. So, how did you really get into it? Did you fall into it, or you know, how did it go? Well, I uh, originally started uh, wanting to be a, a fireman, just like uh, probably a good considerable amount of uh, other dispatchers. Uh, I started thought it was going to be a stepping stone, and. Uh, you know, I started back in January of '99, and obviously, it's not quite a stepping stone. <laughs> right. I've, uh, you got I've, on the uh, life raft and took off sailing. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't uh, thank uh, the department enough for the opportunity to do what I do. I, uh, I absolutely do enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You know, it took me a while to get to that point, but <laughs> right. you get your bad, you get your good days and your bad days. And yeah, exactly. Um, I was actually a firefighter with a department locally, and one of my friends was working part time over at West Bloomfield, and he put in a word for me, and I ended up getting hired right out of the uh, fire academy and continued doing the fire stuff on the side and full time in dispatch, and I, I haven't left since. Yeah, wow. fourteen years in it sounds like you're still you're still very passionate about your job josh yeah oh absolutely i i really uh, i really am so how did try you balance, to keep it how did you balance that out i have uh i have a friend who actually used to work here uh in dispatch as well and uh, he was doing uh dispatch full-time as well as uh he was a firefighter so it was it was crazy because sometimes you know he would get out at one o'clock in the morning and he would be heading home and we would tone out for um right. for first responders and we'd hear him key up right in the radio saying that he's in route so i don't know how he ever slept so how did you do it uh yeah not much sleep that's for sure (laughs) (laughs) i uh you know i was was very lucky um in uh you know in work you know i I almost instantly got weekends off after like being there for two years because a bunch of senior people just up and left oh Oh, wow and uh so it was that that was nice it made it a little easier i could pull a lot of calls on the weekends and uh uh, and during the day you know i was on afternoon shift for for my first eight years Mm -hmm. and uh i i you know i loved it went to day shift for about uh what was it five years now i'm back on noons and and, uh, but I, I can't do the fire stuff anymore. Unfortunately, I've, I've broken myself. So I am, uh, <laughs> I am, st- I am in dispatch for the remainder. And, uh, but you know, I, I don't regret that one bit. I absolutely, uh, am very fortunate for, you know, still having that part of my life. Right. Yeah. And when you say afternoon shifts, Josh, can you, what time do you work there at West? Uh, four to midnight. Four to midnight. Okay. So yep. eight, I do work five, a five day stretch or you, how does that work? Yeah, typically I'll work uh, Monday through Friday, but uh, if anybody needs, you know, a weekend off or something like that, I'm more than happy to accommodate. So I got you. 
Awesome. Well, um, yeah. what about calls? Like, what kind of calls can you uh, can you think of that that really stuck out? Um, you, know, you can start with your first call. Do you remember your first call that you ever took in dispatch? Oh man, uh, <laughs> I can barely remember what I did last week. <laughs> oh, awesome! Yeah. yeah, we get like that um, every now. And then. Well, you know, they, they, there's so many. You know, you take, I've taken 911 calls for people requesting to see if their flight's on time. You know, it's, oh, I've never had that. Well, yeah, one. that's a new one. That's awesome. It's, it's a pretty amazing. <laughs> oh, really quick, Josh, explain where West Bloomfield is in Michigan for our, our listeners. I could or, say East Michigan, but that's not really clarifying very well. Right. Fair enough. So, uh, yep, southeast Michigan, right in the uh, basically in the middle of Oakland County. Uh, we're next door to uh, near Pontiac. Uh, we're just uh, we actually border with Pontiac, uh, right on the northwest corner. I'm sorry, northeast corner. Okay. So. Okay, so if we said Detroit-ish, our our listeners yeah. might kind of have an idea. Yeah, I would consider us Metro Detroit. Absolutely. Okay. Nice. So, <laughs> flights, huh? Um, yeah, that. Yeah, I have never had that uh, before. I know I've had uh, many odd calls, but that would be my first. And I don't know anybody else listening out there, uh, or who will be hearing this. Maybe they can uh, put up some comments or something on the the crazy calls that they've ever taken. Uh, you know, to that aspect that is. But yeah, that's that's rather interesting on on that sense. Yeah, that's uh, something else. I'll tell you. That was a. Uh... Par for the course. <laughs> now, Josh, I uh, we were gotten ton- in contact with you through one of your coworkers, Amanda. I actually had had training with her at one point, and we got connected on Facebook. And I see pictures of her little squirt all the time. And I had uh, touched base with her about doing an interview, and she had brought up a situation that she, you know, she had mentioned that no dispatcher ever wants to be a part of. And it's the truth. I don't think anybody in the world ever wants to be a part of this situation. And you had mentioned that you felt comfortable discussing this. Um, What I want to do is I want to take you back to September. And I would like you just to kind of start from the beginning, what this, how this call came in and then how the events transpired throughout the night. And for our listeners, it's not going to get real graphic, but this is it is going to pull on your heartstrings and it is going to, you know, I might get choked up. I have a tendency to be very tough through most of the things, but there are just a couple of, of situations in my life that really get me. So I'm thankful ahead of time. I want to let you know, Josh, for kind of opening up your world. And I just want to give a heads up to all our listeners out there that, you know, this might be a little bit more heartfelt than some of our other right. podcasts have been. So Josh, uh, let's go back to September now and just kind of let's talk about where you were at in the room and how the call came in. Well, uh, September 9th, um, just like, uh, started off just like any other day, Mm -hmm. just like every other day starts, you know, it's, you're in dispatch, you take the calls, you send the help. Um, I was actually, uh, training, uh, one of our new guys. Um, he was actually in his last day of his training and beginning of the shift, I said, Hey, what do you want? It's your last day. You get to choose. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Hey, well, let's take channel one, which is our uh, main PD channel. So Mm -hmm. I said, "Uh, okay. Uh, so we sat down and you know, the time came around and, uh, uh, Amanda took the uh, 911 call from the family. Mm -hmm. Uh, family said, uh, you know, we, we, we showed up to get our, uh, you know, it was a mom and brother, I believe it was, and they showed up to get their son out of the house because uh, he needed to move out. And uh, he got upset, went how upstairs. Old, how old was and, son? Was son like 15? Was son 40? Oh, you know, my apologies. I think it was actually a mom and brother. Okay. Oh, yeah, the mom and the brother. And uh, um, yeah, he said he got upset. He went upstairs and fired off one shot. And, uh, you know, just Where's like any other call, you'd, you'd take that call and you'd go, you know, that's, that's probably a suicide. Right. You know, that, that you hear one shot and that's it. And you're thinking, well, this guy probably ended it. And, uh, you know, that's what was in our heads the whole entire time. We sent... Uh, Josh, I'm going to jump in here just a couple sure. of different times. Was Amanda on the phone with your caller when that shot was fired? Or did they contact your PD after the shot was fired and said, hey, we need help? We came to get this stuff and he's just fired a weapon. Uh, They contacted us after the shot went off. Okay. Um, I don't believe it was actually over the phone. Okay. Um, And uh, that's when we sent, uh, you know, everybody out there. Um, I think it was about uh, seven, six or seven guys ultimately that were on the scene. 
and uh, you know my friend and coworker Pat O'Rourke was one amongst them. Okay, so now they came over there with like a code response. I'm assuming like lights and sirens. Everybody's flying up there. Yes. Okay. Okay. So you have all these officers respond, and I know in Allegan, and I'm sure everywhere, did they kind of stage and all touch base at one point before they went in there? From what? Yeah. Yep, they staged and uh, they all talked to the family. You know, they got their facts in straight and, um, you know, we try to figure out, you know, if this guy's got any weapons, you know, and, uh, um, it, you know, it, Amanda was able to find out that he had indeed had weapons. We relayed that to the officers. They knew, uh, you know, he had weapons, obviously, because he did fire one shot at that point. Mm-hmm. And, um, they talked to the family. They even asked more questions. I'm, you know, I'm going to assume that they, they certainly, uh, they did everything right. And I think they actually ultimately did uh, above and beyond what we normally would do. Yeah. So when they got there, did Amanda disconnect the 911 call with the caller? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know. I know this um, is a lot it's, going on for you that day. The, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for the most part, like some of the, some of the pieces, um, I, I totally blanked on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't remember them. Yeah, and I just asked you these questions just to set up for our listeners who aren't in the 911 profession. Right. When we talk about being 911 dispatchers or 911 operators or telecommunicators, you know, they picture the 911, where's your emergency? Um, but, you know, once we disconnect that call, there is just an incredibly large portion of our career that's not spent on the phone and that's right. you know, very focused. So I just that's why I'm going to keep asking you these questions just so our listeners know where you were at. Sure. So so then. OK, so if I'm assuming at some point Amanda did disconnect that call, just knowing that officers were on scene and whatnot, and that they had hand, had it handled from there. Yes, absolutely. OK, so then, then what was going on? Uh, you know, they, uh, they formed up a team. Uh, they were there for quite a while. Um, I want to say probably about an hour or so. Okay. And we had, uh, n- numerous of the numerous cops that were not working that night were part of our SWAT team. Oh, okay. And, um, so they didn't have to it, wait for an extended time response or anything like that. If they had a handful of them right on scene. Yep, exactly. And we ended up getting the SWAT truck out there and got a shield uh, and, um, and the you know the long guns and all that, right. and we're prepared for an entry, you know, thinking we're probably going to be recovering somebody. Right. right. That's yeah. yeah that's exactly. the feeling. If you've already heard that shot, you have no communication. He's not hollering out the window. He hasn't made a telephone call to anybody else. Yeah. There's there's zero communication. So you're kind of thinking at that point. You're right. You're going to go in to recover a body, but taking all the precautions in case mm-hmm. that's not the case. Keep on going. Yeah, then uh, we actually did. We tried calling him, tried pinging his phone. Okay. Uh, he was coming back to that location. He wasn't answering. Uh, you know, we had fire department on standby right around the corner. And, uh, you know, they, they, they went into the house. And, uh, they you know, they told us they were going in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, um, I'm hearing shots fired, you know, uh, from one of my uh, my other coworkers, um, Todd. Um, and did he key up on the radio and start yelling that? Okay. Yeah. And at that point I had no idea. I'm thinking, okay, well there's shots, but you know, that doesn't mean anything that they they could, you know, it could be anything. It could be anything. Absolutely. Um, when I heard, uh, officer down, uh, that was the, uh, that was the hardest part. Mm -hmm. And then you'd hear the other guys and I'm, I'm listening for voices, Um, to to find out who it is, you know, who's, who's hurt. Um, I guess I didn't know at that point. And, uh, and that's gotta be the worst thing is when you, when you don't know, especially like you were saying, they, you know, they tell you they're going in and there's that silence. And that's probably the scariest thing is to one, not know, and two have radio silence because you're just sitting there waiting. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then to hear that come out of nowhere, um, Jeez. Yeah, that's that's going to be hard. And Josh, that's so interesting that you mentioned that you were listening for voices. I had never thought that in my head, but that's exactly what we do. We mm-hmm. know these men and women. We know their spouses. We know their children. You know, we buy stuff from their kids for different things at their schools. You just know them on such a personal level. And when you said that, I thought in my mind, incredible. That is so yeah, true that exactly we do what that. Too. Yeah, it was through process of elimination. I was able to, you know, figure out. Okay, so did did you deduce who had been shot, or did 
Did somebody yeah. finally say his name? <laughs> no, I uh, I figured it out because that's not who I was hearing. Okay, so like you said, just the process of elimination through voices and all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it was. Uh, I mean, it was hectic for everybody. I, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, nobody ever wants that kind of stuff to happen, especially right, to, exactly. the, to the, the people you spend the most time with. I, right. I'd like to say that I spend more time with my family, but I spend most time my time with my other family at work. Yeah, because you know we work nights, and most of our families all work during the day, so it's kind of our schedules don't sit right. Josh, yeah. if you had to put a time frame on the moment where you know they were going to make entry into the home and kind of at the time where everything was said and done well first of all so after i'm just trying to get everything set up in my head so there were shots fired now did they did they shoot the suspect how did that go down after that was that was there an exchange of gunfire between law enforcement and the suspect or yes yeah, there, there, there was an exchange. I, I believe uh, there was probably a, f- a gunfire exchange for the next day or so. I believe it was. Really? So he was oh. holed up. So it wasn't yeah. a quick situation. It was, it was over a long period of time then. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. We wow. Clear that up for our listeners. Holy cow! So yeah. you're, because I was what I was trying to get at earlier was trying to figure out if you know it was nine minutes of sheer panic for you or but this is an entire day. You've you know if you want to go on and talk a little bit more about Officer O'Rourke and what happened there. Okay. Uh, well, first off, you know it was, it was funny as uh, as soon as I heard shots fired the first time, I uh, I was like, uh, okay, uh, move over. <laughs> you know, I told oh, I, my trainee, I, I took over immediately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, in retrospect, he he does need to learn, but on the same token, I was so focused right. on yeah, exactly. I I, I want to step in and, and use my my abilities, and I, I I guess I'm a little protective of the guys too. Yeah. Uh, you know that they're. Uh, uh, you know, I, I love those guys more than uh, more than anything. They're they're the best uh, guys I could ask for. Um, but uh, um, sorry, I just got sidetracked there. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, but yeah, it is when I after I heard the shots fired, it was uh, a matter of I, I think minutes uh, before uh, he was in the ambulance and on his way to the hospital. Um, and I mean, he got the best. Uh, he got the best attention. I, I think uh, we have the best paramedics on a, on a, on a fire department I, that uh, you could imagine, and um, you know we got the best cops. They they, they did everything they could. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. Um, unfortunately, you, you'd think that that's probably the worst thing, but it definitely could have been a lot worse. We uh, thankfully had a shield, and that shield probably saved two of our officers' lives. Wow. And I don't even know if we've said it out loud at this point, but Officer Patrick O'Rourke, he passed away in the line of duty that day. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I, and, you know, I did not know that he had died uh, until we called everybody in, mm-hmm. uh, all the dispatchers in. Um, and they showed up day shift dispatchers, midnight shift dispatchers showed up at like midnight, uh, twelve thirty. When and then I was finally able to step out of the room, and uh, and I just uh, I needed to take a break real quick. Absolutely. And uh, I walked to the back, and I, I I walked up to one of the guys. I go, hey, uh, you know the status? And he goes, you know, I'm sorry, man. He uh, he didn't make it. <laughs> that uh, that was the most difficult part. Mm-hmm. Is when I heard that. So, is it just and, because your body's been moving so fast and your mind's been moving so fast, and you finally take a minute to think about yourself, and then you automatically start thinking about your coworker again? I mean, I understand how that could just be so powerful and so just so hard for you. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I've lost a lot of a lot of loved ones. You know, through throughout life, and you know, he uh, that th- that definitely ranks right up there. Um, the, to know him is to uh, know you know true friendship. Uh, the, the way that that guy was with everybody, he was just without a doubt probably the best uh, guy. He always uh, looked out for everybody, and he always had such a big heart. And it came to everything. Now, how as a dispatcher and how as a dispatch center, did you, 
how were you able to go back into that center the next day and still realize that you had a barricaded gunman who had taken the life of one of your friends? How, as a person, how'd you do that? Well, you know, we were fortunate. They had, uh, they put us on uh, administrative leave. Okay. Oh, all right. Um, so we were very lucky. We didn't have that immediately. Um, you know, get right back into the saddle again. That, that wasn't necessary for us um, because we all worked so diligently. Uh, I, you know, you, you handle thousands and thousands of calls. You know, the, I just started my fifteenth year, and you, you handle thousands of calls in that time. And uh, every call, you think maybe I could have done something differently on this one, or a little something differently on that one. You know, this one call. I, I honestly, I don't think that anybody could have done anything differently, and that that in itself tells me, you know, I I don't blame myself, thank God. Yeah. And and I, I know for a fact that none of my coworkers should, because you know, I was working in the room with Jason and Amanda. They both stepped up and they did everything they possibly could do too. I, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just me. It was a team effort. We we all pulled together. We all worked, uh, you know, great together, and we did as much as we could to get the was necessary but unfortunately ultimately it wasn't the case it, it didn't didn't help for pat how did your uh, how did the uh, debriefing process work how, how do you guys i mean does your center do they send people in to uh, sit you guys down and talk to you um or you know how, do, how does that whole how does it work for you guys? Uh, well well they, they they don't really they didn't <laughs> they didn't really have a debriefing um they scooted us away uh, one of our officers uh, scooted us away, me and Amanda, and uh, went, went off to uh, the fire department. They had the chapel in there, and uh, you know we talked with them and with the fire guys for a little while. And then, uh, you know, a couple weeks later, I don't know if you've heard of an organiza- organization called My Cops. I have not. Uh, no. Concerns of police survivors. Okay. Really. Um, it's a national organization, but uh, Michigan has their own chapter. Okay. And, and my cops really kind of stepped up, made contact with one of our one of our officers, and he in turn uh, put out the info to us. And it was basically, you know, like a a, a roundtable discussion, a debriefing, if you will. And we all, you know, talked and and uh, you know, try to get it through our heads. And it, it certainly helped. We we've done that twice. Uh, they haven't had a you know a structured debriefing per se at the police department though. And Josh, this is one of the disadvantages of doing a Skype interview and not having you in the studio with us. But when you said that there wasn't a formal debriefing, Ricardo and I looked at each other and our jaws were almost on the table. We right. both, I mean, our eyes were wide open. And for just for the public to know, a debriefing it doesn't ha- it can be, but it doesn't have to be a hold your hand and you know say good job good job good job but there's actually a very psychological part about it it's mm-hmm. it's broken down into steps and it's a lot of realization and acceptance and learning and you know i feel really sad that you and your two coworkers didn't have that and i almost feel frustrated because you have to you know even though you're on administrative leave you have to come back and do your job still and that can be a lot to hold on to you sound like a very independent and a very well spoken and smart person but you know, there's some people that might, you know, just might really hold on to that and think I could have done more. I can't mm-hmm. believe, you know, that happened. Yeah, it, uh, uh, you know, they actually, you know, I kind of, they did give us about, I think it was about an hour with a, uh, with a um, psychologist uh, in the training room. And they basically gave us some paperwork and said, these are what you can expect you know, so on, so on, so forth. But uh, I think we all would have benefited more of having, you know, like I said, like a roundtable discussion, debriefing where everybody involved was mandated to be there. And, you know, and, and we all talked. Yeah. Yeah. Because you guys understand each other more than the psychiatrist would, like you said, just throwing you a piece of paper, you know, saying this is what this you're, you're going to feel. feel. Yeah. And you know, it's so like, mono or robotic you know that's not that's not how we are and and that's why that's why we wanted to talk about stuff like this because we want people to understand that like Whitney was saying earlier there's a lot more that happens after the phone call there's a lot that goes on during but afterwards there's so much more that's going on and then with everything that you've told us obviously there was a lot more that uh that happened 
And, uh, you know, we need that. We need to be able to talk to people that, um, not, not so much that we can, you know, trust, but those that know exactly what we've gone through or what we are going through. Not like, you know, not like that with someone just giving you a piece of paper of symptoms or something to look forward to. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree 100 percent. And most of the time, you know, as I, I, hey, I do hear it a lot where, you know, dispatches are often often overlooked. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but it, it wasn't sure. just us. You know, I guess we kind of we probably all feel a little bit like, you know, everybody was kind of overlooked. Yeah. And no department ever wants to be really successful doing debriefings because they've done so many of them. I mean, that's not what any department wants. They don't want to say, well, yeah, we keep doing these things and we're doing a really good job. You don't ever <laughs> want to be in a situation where you have to do these debriefings. So I yeah. understand that that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not knocking your department at all. Yeah. I'm no, I have no, I, I, I got nothing bad to say. I yeah, mean, I feel just, you know, as you being in the same line of work, I almost consider you a coworker. I just, I feel for you because that just, it, you know, excuse me, but that just had to suck taking mm-hmm. that home. Yeah, exactly. So from from there, Josh, um, how did your department move forward? So we didn't have this debriefing. We didn't have anybody come in to do all this restructuring or whatever in your department. How did you say as with your friendships, with your other coworkers, how did that move forward? Was there any like getting together after work and hanging out? Was there anything, any time spent with Officer O'Rourke's family, anything like that? Yeah, uh, we definitely pulled together as a group. Uh, I think I think we all have gotten a little bit closer when it comes to uh, you know looking out for each other and and uh, talking to each other, making sure everybody knows that you know, hey, you know, we haven't forgot about you. We still you know think about we still care about you, and if you need anything, you know where to come. You know, yeah. uh, we definitely have gotten uh, grown a little bit, uh, quite a bit in that way. Mm-hmm. But, um, I shouldn't say, but, and also, you know, we, the, the guys, uh, spent a lot of time with their family. Um, Pat's closest friend, uh, Todd, he, uh, he uh, spends a lot of time with Amy and her kids and, and, you know, a lot of the guys, uh, still do too. A lot of guys went over to her house and helped her with her yard work and, oh, that's good. and, um, help her with all of the, you know, uh, other stuff that comes along with losing somebody in line of duty. You know, everybody wants to help yeah. right? and it's hard to keep everything straight, uh, when you got so much thrown at you. Yeah, so definitely. she's got so much on her plate, and I tell you, that's without a doubt the strongest woman that I could ever imagine. Well, <laughs> um, for for any of our uh, listeners, you know, other dispatch centers or anything, what advice uh, do you have for anyone else who's dealt with a situation like this, whether it be debriefings, talking to just talking to coworkers, or do you have any advice to help others that might you know may have gone through a situation like this? Um, you know, just, uh, I guess the best thing I could probably say is trust in the fact that you, you, you did your best mm-hmm. and ultimately it's, it's somebody else's decision to do what they do. It's not, it's not in any way, shape or form, you know, their fault. I think that that's a biggest thing. Uh, I didn't necessarily struggle with it. I don't believe any of my coworkers did, but from what I hear, that that that, that is a, a big thing. And trust in the in the friendships that you have with the guys you work with and the and the girls work with, and and get uh, and rely on them. If you need help, get it. And don't be afraid to go to whatever you can. To get that help, you know, I, I've been to two of those my cops meetings. I've, uh, you know, I've talked to my friends over and over again, my family, my uh, my coworkers. You know, talk it out, listen to what other people have to say, what they, you know, what they're going through. It helps you too. You know, commu- communicate if you're having problems with it, communicate it, and don't be proud. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's the worst saying. thing you could do. Yeah. Yeah, and I I really like the fact that you just said, you know, trust. Trust that you're doing your job correctly. Trust in the friendships that you have with your with your coworkers because, you know, when you're working over radio and over phone lines, you do. You have to have that sense of trust in these people that you work with. Oh, absolutely. 
That's, Absolutely. That's great that you did that. Um, I encourage everybody when we post this episode, when you're listening to it, we're also going to post a link to my cops. Um, Ricardo and I have kind of been sending each other messages back and forth about, you know, this is a really great program and mm -hmm. I'm not sure where funding lies in it and that kind of stuff. That's something we have to look into more, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely post up a link um, for that, for more information on the My Cops and that is going to be our wrap up for episode number seven. So thank you very much, Joshua, for talking to us today. Um, this was you know definitely one of our more uh, serious episodes. I mean, they've all been serious, but mm -hmm. this one is something we really wanted, you know, to, to share with people so that they know more you know what we do and especially for other dispatch centers so that they can know uh you know like you were saying don't don't be afraid don't be proud make sure you get that help out there so thank you very much for joining us yeah josh your vulnerability and your transparency you know are appreciated by both ricardo and myself and i can assure you that all of our listeners are really going to appreciate that too because that's not something people really like or want to open up about and show that really raw side but doing that has been incredibly beneficial for all of our listeners so uh, on behalf of Ricardo and I, we do want to thank you again for, for all of this today. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, guys. Yeah, you have yourself a great work evening. I know you have to head into work tonight. Be a night owl again tonight. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah, so um, if anybody, uh, any of the listeners out there, you can always reach us by email. Uh, there is two of them. There is the jcast at jeblog.com, and you'll be getting your responses probably from Whitney or I. But uh, hers will be wttpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at jeblog, and all of the posts will be up on the jabberlog.com. Uh, thank you very much once again. Have a good one. Till next time. You just listened to Within the Trenches on the Jcast. If you have any questions or would like to be a guest on the show, send an email to the Jcast at the jabberlog.com.